so much for being here. Welcome to Camera Club. Hello, thank you so much for having me. So today, today, right now, I'm interested in changing the way that we engage with matter that's presented in this slide. I'm typically spoiled and able to bring people into the galleries of the Art Institute and talk about works of art in the presence of the works of art. I'm going to be showing you some works today that are in the collection that will further entice you to go and see them. But the way that I want us to engage with the talk today is to consider what happens between making something visible and having something that is seen. What happens when we go from looking at something to actually seeing it? As patients, we are looked at, but we want to be seen. Paul Clay, as an artist, presented his work and in fact his entire identity in a way that he was very committed to making visible himself and a beautiful panoply of personal, intimate, and political experiences, but all in a way that is very enigmatic that has never been directly able to fasten down this equals that, but instead in a way that even now I think really fosters empathetic engagement. So I wanted to show you these particular works to start out, just to show and to get us to consider works of art something that we can make associations with. So this is a work from the very last year of his life. He entitled all of his work, The Star Teaches Bending, he also, within the works, it's very important that not only we have the title, but we have the date that it was made and the order. I'll describe that later. But how we understand works of art has a lot to do with how we see it. So, in this context, I very um, heavy-handedly put it next to this photograph of Paul Clay and his wife Lily as, as he was photographed in the South in 1933. Because I want us to notice that the association of the star that teaches bending, we may not have looked at these figures as being human figures, but of course, when I put it next to Paul and Lily, we make that association. But as importantly, I want us to recognize that Paul played is funny. He had a fantastic sense of humor. So as we go through these works, what I ask is that you look and not only listen to what I'm saying as a way of understanding it, but more to the point, look at it and see how you see it and how you understand it and the associations you make. <coughs> Go. This is where the original phrase came from, art does not reproduce the visible, rather it makes visible. So as we go through this, I want us to consider what we can see. And here we see on the left a very early work of Paul Clay's, which is called Winged Hero. Made in 1905, he was born in 1889, but did not come to visual arts until he was in his late teens and early 20s. And most of his work started in the beginning with etchings. And etchings, he was a German artist, he came from Switzerland. Etchings had a very long tradition. The, probably the most famous um, engraver or etcher at the time would be of uh, the past would have been Albert Durer. And there were these kind of almost gothic looking images, and you can see that they seem to be almost illustrative and kind of fantastical. So I want us to get familiar with being unfamiliar, with the idea of things that are fantastical. And on the right we have what is known to be or thought to be his very last work that was actually titled by his son, Untitled Still Life, and it was made in 1940. The other thing that I want us to always pay attention to is what the material is as it's listed. So you see here this is an oil on canvas, and that's what we're familiar with with paintings, but that's going to change. As you see here, this is the only medical image that I'll show you, I promise, but I did have to include it. Because when I was asked to give this talk on Paul Clay and his illness and his artwork, I have to say my first inclination was to say no. Because I didn't want to look at his works of art and only look at them in terms of his illness. I didn't want it to get to the point when someone would look at a painting of his made in 1936 after he started to become symptomatic and say, oh, that's when I can tell his face was starting to stiffen. I don't want it to ever be that reductivist. But what I realized is that the enthusiasm that the medical community has shown for Clay's work as it was manifested here within this exhibit 
This was actually um, an exhibit that was in Bern that was by the medical profession, the medical uh, staff of all of the works of Paul Clay that resulted in this remarkable book called Paul Clay and His Illness by Hans Suter, which actually influenced a lot of my research today. But I want us to consider how we also might look at Paul Clay's work. So a fun fact, Paul Clay was ambidextrous. This photograph, which many people have looked at to decide whether he had the sclerosis um, symptoms in his hands, which he did not. Also, we can see what it is that the left brain and the right brain do, and the different kind of almost diametrically opposed functions that they hold. And as we look at the works of Paul Clay, I want you to notice that I would argue that both sides of the brain are very much in play. We have as many ordering principles as we have chaotic principles. We have as much of a sense of the creative and the fantastical as we have of the specific and the scientific. So I'd like us to consider this as an empowering way to make the associations, as I said, as we might, of what you could bring to the work. So how have, or have artists in the past, had illnesses and have they chosen to make them visible? Well, actually, not a colleague, but actually half a generation before, Edvard Munch created these works. And Munch actually suffered from a serious interlocular um, hemorrhage in both his right and his left eye. And so Munch took, Munch took it upon himself to show us what it was like to see the world through that ocular obstruction. And so he created these two worlds, these two worlds, these two images, disturbed vision on the left and the right, to show us what it was like to see the world from that perspective. And you can see that Wilk includes some things which is quite, quite typical for his compositions with all of the different colorations and these beautiful fluid lines and these gorgeous waves of color. But he's also very clear at making these kind of poignant dark spots in the very center that as the self-portrait shows, he then turned into a kind of fantastic creature of a bird. So there was one artist's attempt. This is something that I think is crucial about Clay's work. This is how the Museum of the Art Institute presents his work. And I want you to get a sense of, first and foremost, what a different size makes. So when we're looking at the works of the Art Institute, they're actually hung here. There's one. There are three that are there in the series right now. But I want you to notice that they're actually quite sculptural. They're not flat up against the wall. I'll describe that further as we go along. But they're about the size as our face. And that matters tremendously in terms of how we engage with the work of art. It's a profoundly different experience to look at this than to look at this exquisite Francis Picardia of the 12 danseuses. So I want you to think about that and the kind of intimacy that that elicits. So a bit of a history about Paul Clay. Paul Clay comes from a family of musicians. He was born in Bern. His father was an instructor at an academy, at a music academy there. His mother was also a musician. And Paul Clay himself was a very accomplished violinist. This is true, and you'll see this in all of his biographies. He actually was so good that by the time he was 11, he was invited as a violinist to take part in the chamber group at, um, in Bern, part of the symphony. But he continued to play and decided not to become a musician, but instead to incorporate music in many ways in his art, but would continue to play. And here he's playing in this group. The Near Studio was actually the first artist that he studied with because he wasn't accepted into the academy initially. But when he moved to Munich, he started to play with the group, so they would paint and then they would play. And I wanted to show you just some examples of how his artwork reflected music. Some was quite directly in the way that he titled it. It also gives you a sense of the incredible range of artwork that he presented stylistically. Here you can see a watercolor with pen and brush and brown ink, which is kind of hard to decipher, but it's this very jolly depiction of dance from the sound of bells, oboes, and violin from 1929. So you can see within this work these very simple single line drawings that are set in this exquisite kind of wash of watercolors. Contrast that with this work of 1932 called Polyphony. And I want you to consider the concept of polyphony. We'll talk more about how this work is constructed in a little bit. But the idea of polyphony is also very important. Polyphony is many voices playing simultaneously. 
And in some ways, I would suggest that as this is called polyphony, there is a bit of a polyphony that's happening here within the way this work is created. Just for a second, look at this and imagine how different these characters would look if it was not within this watercolor background. The fact that we have both of those sources of information that's set in this kind of dreamlike sepia setting affects the way that we engage with the work and the way that we can see it as almost a dreamscape rather than something that's just a mere cartoon. Does that make sense? So before Paul Clay um, was an actual working artist, before he was there um, at the Near Studio, um, he was in Bern, and this was with his parents, and he met Lily. Lily Stumpf Clay was very important. They were married in 1906. They actually met in 1899. She too was a musician. She was a pianist. And in fact, their son, Felix Clay, who's considerably older there, was born in 1907, so he was 27 at the time they were married, 28 when Felix was born. And for a terrific change of pace, Lily is the one who supported them financially. Lily would teach piano, and Paul would be the person who was responsible for taking care of Felix. And the reason I bring this up is because a lot of his work has been referred to as being very childlike, and though there are definitely theoretical reasons for doing that, but he also spent a lot of time actually making work with Felix, including this fantastic array of, of puppets. You can see there's actually a terrific YouTube video about his hand puppet. But the fact that this is something, this is actually Felix, as I said before, that made such an impact on his son and literally animated their life together, I think is an interesting way to think of a form of education. It's not just within the constructs of the academy, but actually in his work with his family and with his son that his artwork began to grow. So, what happens when he finally, he and Lily and Felix moved to Munich from Bern in 1910, is that he very quickly meets with other artists from what's known as the Blue Rider, which is a group of artists from the early part of the 20th century that were very influential in Munich at the time. One of the things that's so important about Clay and the other artists working at this period of time in the early part of the 20th century in Europe is it's not like people were just making works of art and then retreating quietly to their little garrisons. Work was presented along with manifestos, along with forming groups, along with seceding. There was a presentation of the artist as being a very important political and social force. And how they were engaging with their public was never just a matter of creating works that were put in galleries and museums. So the Blue Rider was very much interested in taking the idea of art and removing it from the institution, whether it was the academy or the museum, and instead looking for the truth in art as it was um, represented within color and also with more kind of primitive forms. So primitive, as it would be def defined, it's not a very good way to put things these days, but in ethnographic works, African works, the works of children and the works of the mentally ill. They would write within this almanac, which Kandinsky produced in 1912, that you would find greater truth in those works than you would in works that were created in the academy. So the idea of looking for the truth and being on the outside of the established institution were critical elements for this group and for many of the groups working at the time and absolutely influenced the way that Clay would pursue his work, both within these groups and outside. One of the things that I think is most important when we look at Paul Clay as well as many other artists is who the other artists are in their life. A very important person for Paul Clay, and I really love this photograph, and I'm only going to show funny photographs, obviously, is this is when Kandinsky and Clay were posing as Schiller and Goethe. This is a, bit of a number of years later in 1929. But I wanted to point out that it was here that they met one another. And it's also here, and around this period of time in 1911, that you can see Paul Clay has decided that he's going to craft himself as an artist, but as an artist that is there to present himself to the public. And how does he do that? He ends up going and getting all of his work in the past and starts this intense cataloging. So within the work, he writes down the work itself. And by the way, when I say writes down, 
he writes with his left hand, and he paints and draws. Writes with his right, paints and draws with his left. Super fun to think about. All right, so he's within this, writing with his right hand. What he does is he annotates the work, the specific date that it was made, so it's the title, the work number, and then whether it was studied from nature with an N or abstract. So he is cataloging his works and at the same time begins writing diaries as well because he's interested in making sure that he and his work and his process is documented. All of those are what it means to be an artist. Now, Kandinsky is a crucial element because Kandinsky is also producing and publishing what is become and still a very influential text, text concerning the spiritual in art. This book is quite interesting, it's very thin. It was published in 1913, and inside it says things like, put a green circle next to a blue line, and it's going to create this kind of emotional effect. The idea is, and this is so critical, is you're creating an experience that is not something about an illustration, not something that's about a narrative, but you're looking for something that is to be a spiritual experience. And the idea of abstraction for clay, and these are actually two works that are in the Art, Art Institute, is to take something where you can see he started here with these kind of folkloric images, Russian folklore images, and then they become kind of dispersed and distilled and then expanded into this much more abstract interactions between planes of colors and calligraphic shapes and forms that are still these kind of suggestions of representation because the hope is that this will bring the universal experience. That more people are going to connect to the emotions that are evoked by these plays and colors than they are by the idea of these horsemen and these three <coughs> noble figures on the right hand side. So I want us to think about that, that though we may not look at abstract art as being something that's the most engaging or easy to understand, the intention was exactly the opposite. So, I'm showing you this particular work in this really awkward photograph because I want you to notice this particular frame. You can't see it clearly here, but it, when it's installed in the museum, you'll notice that it's actually painted kind of in a very childlike way. And what this is about is about really incorporating the idea of craft into fine art. So Paul um, Vasily Kandinsky created this to give you a sense that there is no difference between fine art and craft and instead that this kind of Jugendstil all over sensibility is to make the work again more approachable, but also something that really um, reveres the craftsmen that are um, in the world, and also to kind of make sure that other artists keep up with the kind of craftsman tradition. But those were not the only other artists that Clay and Kandinsky were looking at. 1911 and 1912, they go to Paris and they see the work of Brock and Picasso. And here you can see the idea from Cubist works, um, and I'll just quickly give you a description of that. And I want you to know this is a wonderful portrait of Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, who was actually a friend of plays later on. And this is George Brock, Little Harbor in Normandy, because I want you to notice what you can see and what you can't. So what's astonishing to me about this portrait of Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, which by the way he sat for, he did like 20 sittings for, and then came up with this, is not just how remarkable it is in terms of all of the different squares and abstract forms, but the fact that we really can discern that this is still a portrait, that that's a man's head, that that's his nose, that's his kind of pompadour. But we can see things from a multiplicity of angles and thus a multiplicity in terms of how we come to understand it. So when I look, for example, at this portrait of Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, I see that his nose is both the nose and the leg of a table. And it's important that it is both the leg of a table and a nose because both of those interpretations influence the way we view the work and the kind of sense that we make of it. Is it making fun of him? Is it about suggesting that he is something that's a kind of Biedermeyer personality with this ridiculous pompadour? All of those influence the way that we look at the work and none of them suggest that there's a singular understanding. The most influential, or one of the most influential artists who is not Kandinsky or not German, would have been Robert Delaunay. This is one of the works we have at the museum, Sean the Marlin Red Tower. And it was actually for color and light that he found him most influential. And I want you to notice here 
the idea that is um, just that is position that is about the sheer optimism that these artists had at this time for the modern. And so you can see that the Eiffel Tower, which was just built in 1900, is bursting through with color and light. And that color and light represents the energy and the vitality of what they believe the modern industrial age would bring. Similarly, with the Blue Rider, they believe that the modern era, including World War I, was going to be this tremendous opportunity for a reset. So the war was going to be brief, it was going to end in a year or so, and one of the two of the major members, Franz Marc and um, August Malka, who actually enlisted straight away, were very straightforward saying that this is another way for us to reset humanity, and, and which sounds really creepy, but instead it was about resetting and allowing people to grow from the ground up. So the ideological, idea that the future is the, is the promise, as well as the craft and the kind of people from the past. But influentially, you can see here in 1914, there was a very important trip that Maka and Clay took, which was to, meet, to Tunisia. And it was in Tunisia that he actually started to move to more paintings. And now he's doing works that you can see shift from the representational to these beautiful watercolors where these forms become distilled down to more kind of geometric forms of shifting panes of color. And here you can see Baca doing a very similar work. And it was here that he set apart himself as a painter and became known for this very famous statement, the color possesses me, I don't have to pursue it, it possesses me always, I know it. Color and I are one, I am a painter. And here you can see in Mark's garden, 1915, this is the work that he, he created after that one week trip to Tunisia. It is also important that by this time, in 1916, he was um, drafted into the army for World War I. At the very same day that he was drafted into World War I, the person that he had gone on that trip with was actually, um, they got the notification that he had died. So, while he was there, and because of his friend's death, none of the artists actually had to serve at the front line. They were concerned that, um, how would they put it, that German artists were going to be um, taken away, and they were going to be ruined, and so what we needed to do was protect them. So we're going to keep them away from the front line, and he instead worked to paint airplanes, and continue to paint at that time, paint his own work. This is one of the works that we have in the museum. Death in the Garden from 1919. Um, and you can see here some of those things that we've seen in the past with those beautiful paints of color, but also you'll notice the use of imagery that you see here. Yeah, the use of imagery as you see this figure here. So the Death in the Garden suggests a kind of narrative, but instead it also looks a bit like a fairy tale. We have no idea what the legend is, but we know in this beautiful small work that it's supposed to be something that represents almost a memory. So one of the other aspects of the thing that is important is that this work is made as an oil on cotton on cardboard. So when you look at it, I want you to consider the fact that it is something that is necessarily difficult to decipher. When you put oil on cotton, it, split, it spreads out, it becomes more diffuse, and thus it suggests even more of that dream state. And also, just imagine that when I look at a work that is made of these multi, kind of multifaceted textiles, the touch of the work influences the way that I feel about it. I'm a body that has three dimensions, and I look at this work and I see it also as a body. And I want us to think about that later, because of course, that has a lot to do with what happens when our body changes. Um, this is also a rather interesting work with the Eagle in 1918, because I wanted to show it in the context of the way that Clay wants us to understand his work. This is from that same creative credo. It says, the visible is only an isolated example and that other truths are latently in the majority. So the shift is that things appear in their extended and manifold sense, seemingly contradicting yesterday's experiences. The aim is to reveal the fundamental idea behind the coincidental. So don't trust what you have previously seen, but expand your understanding into the more creative, the more imaginative, the more fantastical. And there was probably no better place to do that than the Bauhaus. In 1921, 
He was given the opportunity to uh, be a member of the Bauhaus, which was also started in 1919, with his friend Kandinsky. Initially, the Weimar, um, Weimar was a location of the Bauhaus, which was started by Walter Gropius and architects and other artists. This is actually designed by Gropius in the South. And the purpose of the Bauhaus was to create an environment where all media of art, whether it was glass making, book binding, architecture, or painting, were taught at the same time. That was all part of the curriculum. So that the general idea that you would have an all over artwork and a, and a kind of Jugendstil, so you would have this all encompassing aesthetic experience that would influence the way people live their lives. As you may know, Walter Gropius had a lot to do with the way IIT here in Chicago was developed, and one of the most important leaders of the Bauhaus was Mies van der Rohe, but that's another thing. What I want you to notice here is Paul Klee working in his Weimar Bauhaus studio, and this is his piece on the Syrian game that was actually completed in 1925. Another important element about Clay in terms of his authorship is that he actually, what would, he would do is he would go to flea markets to find his frames and then create his works accordingly. So that's allowing chance to determine the scale of his work. But as importantly is he actually made all of the brushes that he used. So the importance of craft in determining every element of what he was doing and the kind of intentionality was there kind of coinciding with the idea that he would allow the frames and the actual scope of his work to be determined by that which he happened, happened to find. One of the other elements that's critical about his work that was noted by many people at the time is he was always working on a number of works at the same time. So he would have four or five canvases or drawings going, he would sit back and then he would attack, this is the way one of the artists described it, he would attack the works and study them to make different editions at different times. But what's most interesting about the Bauhaus in terms of what they would describe are the costume parties that they would have. This, the essential difference between the fancy dress balls organized by the artists of Paris, Berlin, and Moscow and the ones here at the Bauhaus is that our, customs, our costumes are truly original. Now, no one in tow, now, with the intimate details about the big wing, Tansky prefers to appear decked out as an antenna. Feininger is two right triangles, Gropius is a Corbusier, and Clay as the song of the blue tree, a rather grotesque menagerie, the dance is non-stop. So the idea of a community of artists who was committed to this very serious idea of basically building this utopian environment, but doing so while dressing it as an antenna and other kinds of um, collaborative engagements shows that the spirit of fun and the spirit of camaraderie was such an intimate part of the way that the work was produced. That was the fertile ground that created not only visual works of art, but this remarkable testament of these pedagogical sketchbooks that he created in 1925 that actually are still used today. And you can see that they describe, again, similarly what different shapes and forms create in terms of the impact and also the sense of momentum that things like arrows present, and the sense of how physics can be met with um, linear design. But what I want you to notice here is, again, that first page of that catalog, which is now being updated more and more, and just including the further parts of his, out, of his artwork and his outlay. I also want you to notice, because you can look at this online, his personal diaries also became his open notebooks. And they're all available, all 3,900 pages now, if you want to see those notebooks online. And they give a beautiful kind of student's work as to how he would create the kind of chromatic colors in his paintings. I want us to get an understanding also of how we come to see Clay's work. This is his work of the Bauhaus. This is a wonderful cartoon that was made of him as an instructor, as the Buddha of the Bauhaus by one of his students. But I want you to see that the playfulness of this beautiful fish magic, oil and watercolor on panel, also can become a pair of leggings if you want. But I want you to look at this work and notice what you can see and what you can't. It seems, of course, very childlike. Um, supposedly, one of the things that he was doing with the students in 1925 is they'd come back to the studio and he would ask them to observe the movements of the fish and then try to record those within his artwork. But you can see here, 
there's a sense of this being kind of a composite of a number of different works that seem to be very flat, but also to be almost as if they are floating within a mobile. And he does so on this black background, which looks almost like something that you would do so that if you were to scratch, you could see the image underneath. So I want you to look at this and again consider what is it that we can decipher that seems to be peeking through and what seems to be hidden because of the materials that he's choosing. Here you can have a better um, kind of understanding of the full range of the kind of work that he did. So here you would have this beautiful separation in the evening where you have these chromatic stripes of the different colors as they make their way, meet their way to the center like a landscape with these arrows that give a really interesting sense of are they representing energy forces, which is one way he wrote about it, or are they representing the way that we look at that horizon line? But what it does to us is it brings the dynamism of the work and brings us into it in terms of a direction. We follow the arrows and the power of the arrows. This is um, in 1933 when, this is, or rather, in 1931 and 1933, <laughs> Clay decided to take a position at the Dusseldorf Academy and because he wanted to stop teaching and do more painting. The Dusseldorf, the Dusseldorf Academy probably couldn't be more different than the Bauhaus because it's a very traditional art academy. It actually was then and is now. Um, but it was at this time in 1933 that the Nazis came to power, the National Socialist Power. They came to his studios. They, um, in order to go through all his artwork, they took six bushels of his notebooks. They also asked for him to attest to the fact that he was an Aryan. And then they shut his studio. He was then, in 1934, he was removed from his position at Dusseldorf. And he and his family retreated and ended up having to move to what um, became, this was, a, this was the last home that they had, to a three-bedroom apartment here in Bern. At the same time, however, he had an art show that he curated of all his work, basically, from 1911 until 1935. And I want us to have a quick look at those now, because I want us to get a sense of how he wanted his work presented. First and foremost, notice that he has a range of works, and they're all hung at the same length. Um, and this man is a very good friend of his, William Roman. And Groman actually wrote his uh, biography and then is here giving a speech on his work. And this is the way that he described it. The unconscious and the superconscious combines with the empiricism and reason to make an exception untied. It is a graphic, visual, and controllable unity. For what is the use of an artistic gift unless it works with clear means of expression? For 30 years, Clay has been putting all his strength into the exploration of these means, with the result that today he can paint almost anything, not only facts, but also processes, inner complexes, any number of modes of consciousness. And so I want you to look at these works and understand this is the way Clay wanted himself to be presented. So, here you can see a work that is critical because fear, in 1934, we're starting to understand, is this the fear that he is experiencing? As we look at these works, consider the concepts of fear and pain, as well as joy and hope that you can see coming up through the works between now and the end of his life. So fear is a work that is a, a gouache on wax and burlap. Gouache is kind of like watercolor. So to put that on burlap means that you have to create a very simple kind of wax um, covering for it, which would give it this sense almost of skin. But I want you to notice but this is not the first time that he was creating these kinds of evocative works, but this is a new that he made in 1910. And this oil on muslin on board, again, gives you the sense of an actual body that comes through. It, because it isn't flat, that means that we look at this not only as something that is a representation, but as an object unto itself. It is a body. And you can also see it's important that this does look as much like an eye. That it, is, that it is called fear, because it uh, invites us to engage with it empathetically. What does fear look like? What does fear feel like? You can also notice that the difference in when you put arrows in this particular work and you use arrows here. These are some of the other works that he presented, and I want you to notice the uh, incredible range of representations that he presented.
This is one of my personal favorites. This is the goldfish, which you can see is similar to the other um, aquarium shop that we saw. But this is Mr. Um, Shining Pearl, which is a watercolor, but it is also something that's showing these um, laws of physics where the different sizes or the different shapes, if they're tilted at different angles, still have the same volume. So supposedly we're supposed to understand the physics of the work and enjoy the fact that this is Mr. Shining Pearl. So polyphony and at Carnassum are very famous works of his because of the pointillist technique that he takes on. And they're beautiful, almost mosaic pieces. They're similar to the ways, works that he painted when he left the, um, Egypt. He was there for a month in 1949. But you can see that the pointillism that is used by clay is very different than the, po the pointillism that we see in our friend Georges Seurat. And this is from the island of La at the museum. This is Sunset, which is at our museum. And you can see that there are similar elements in this beautiful large-scale work at Parnassum as we have at, on Sunset in 1933, where the pointillism is only being used here to create these individual kind of floating bodies. But now it has a very different effect and this kind of glittering effect on these larger canvases. The effect becomes even more intense in terms of the social isolation when the degenerate art show was in Munich in 1937, and 17 of Clay's pictures were included, and 102 works were removed from German collections. So Clay is now living in Bern, um, trying to get Swiss citizenship, while he is no longer allowed to be seen or to work with the other artists. His son and his um, daughter-in-law are still in Germany, but he must continue to work um, in Switzerland. And it's at this time that we start to notice that he becomes um, symptomatic. This is from Hans Sutter's book, Paul, um, Paul Clay and His Illness. And you can see that this is how Sutter gives a recap of what happened. This is Clay. This is Lily took the picture. That is Felix. That's Clay's dad and mom. And that's uh, Will Groman and his wife. So in the initial phase, the important part is that he was experiencing measles and the flu. The only kind of, kind of scleroderma that he experienced was a mask on his face. And the way that they were posthumously able to identify that is by looking at his, the mask, as they were describing it, that you would see here. There is no written description of clay as experiencing skin stiffening. In fact, he never actually described his symptoms at all. So what you see described here are things that Souter and other doctors have actually gleaned posthumously, as I said, since that time. The doctors that he was seeing, he started to see doctors here when he was getting these measle-like um, kinds of pustules on his body, were things that were being defined as a vasomotor of neuroses. So they understood that it had something to do with the vascular problem, but they had no idea that it was causing all of these other systemic problems. Later, um, he became infected very much by the esophageal disorders, and that caused him um, quite a bit of pain, such that he couldn't eat when he was around other people. He would go discreetly and break his food down because he had such a difficult time swallowing. But again, none of this is something that he's writing about. What he does write about in his correspondence and in his diaries is about his energy level. He would end up being out of work and being able to only go to sanitariums in the mountains for three months at a time, and then he would come back. And that influenced the amount of output. And this is part of the reason I think that so many physicians love Paul Clay, is because he was supposedly diagnosed or certainly symptomatic. Most here, this is when the onset of his disease, and this is the year before he died when he created 1,253 works. And as I said, he not only created 1,253 works, but he documented 1,253 works. So, and within this, I can see this is the last page of this document, or this is from 1936 of his notebook, where he said, where he writes in, um, he writes in, we know in Latin, um, a line every day. So it was important for him to create at least one artwork every day. But the kind of artwork that he created is another reason why this work is so um, evocative and also something that really draws us in to understanding what kind of pain or what kind of joy was he experiencing the last few years of his life. 
If I look at the symptom to be diagnosed in good time in 1935, without that date and just called symptom to be diagnosed in good time, we would assume that that had to do with his personal health. But this drawing actually is referencing the Nazi Socialist Party. So the idea is his awareness of what's happening with that particular disease. And I want you to keep that in your mind, that that ambiguity is he speaking of the social, of the political condition, or is he speaking of his physical condition? And the fact that those two things coalesced is very important. Not to mention there's the idea that his illness was triggered by the stress of that living in exile, of having to leave Germany, which no one will ever know. But outbreak of fear in 1939, you can see that this seems to be a very different feeling because of the fact that it's got a face in it. But I also want you to notice how it affects us to have this work that again is done in these kind of brown sepia colors that suggests a face that is disorganized. We can recognize an open mouth and we can see the eyes as they're kind of akimbo, but this disjointed body and knowing that he was experiencing a time when his body was something that he could no longer depend on and no longer trust, we can see that because of the dismemberment of the body that's represented here. We not only see that, but we are brought closer to feel it because of the fact that it is created in this intimate kind of setting with this beautiful, multifaceted, um, multivalent work. At the same time, he's creating the biggest work that he's ever done, including Isla del Sabara, which means um, bitter sweetness. In 1938, which is this beautiful oil to wash on newspaper on June. So a fantastic, multifaceted, multidimensional piece on canvas with his own framing. And this is Rich Harbour, I want to give you a sense of exactly how big it was. And I want you to think again about the idea of chaos and order, because here we look at this and think that we can understand it from a kind of hieroglyphic or ideograph perspective, as if there's a language of symbols, some of which we represent, almost kind of keep herring esque but beneath it, th that's not the only language. You can see that they're also, almost like we're looking at a gallery of shapes behind it. So this is something which gives us the opportunity to interpret the work not only in terms of the kind of colors and forms and geometric forms and the quietness that it brings with it, but also the movement of the kind of calligraphic forms up in front of it. High Spirits in 1938, it's very important to know that as of 1936, Clay could no longer smoke nor play the violin. And so here it is creating what people believe to be is a self-portrait where he seems to be able to smoke yet again. But you can see the idea of this man on a tight wire and the kind of merriment that is suggested um, and the kind of joy that you can see um, presented is also set within this beautiful kind of sepia soft background which gives us a sense, again, of the way that we look at something almost in our own memory. Glass facade in 1940 can show you exactly what has happened with some of those paints of colors and how they have evolved to become a wet paint on burlap on canvas piece unto itself, which suggests almost kind of a, like a quiet closing stained glass window. Twilight flowers, a beautiful long, large scale work, which gives you the sense of spring, and I want you to get a clearer sense of the material that's used there, because this hefty jute looks at, almost makes it look like something that would come from someone's home. But the simplicity of it is part of the beauty, part of the kind of um, inspiration. Death and Fire from 1940, I think, is an important work for us to look at, and the reason why is because number 332 is one of the very last works that he made, and you can see that Death on Fire, this actually says the word Tod, which is the word death in German. And so people are always looking to this as being a kind of suggestion of how he was feeling at the time if he was aware of his own mortality. An important element to know when we're looking at Clay's work, however, is that he did not know. He was never told that he had a terminal illness, nor was Lily, nor was anyone in his immediate circle. He was creating work that would express what was going on within him and how he was experiencing his experiencing his own energy fluctuations and his own engagement with the world. It wasn't something that was mediated with the sound of a clock ticking. 
Mass pain. I want us to look at mass pain quickly to understand why is it when I look at this drawing of mass pain, I feel that pain and I relate to that pain in a very different way than mask of fear, which seems to be almost a parody of what fear looks like. It matters not only because of the fact that this is drawn in these very simple kind of childlike forms, but when I look at these particular drawings with the way that the sketches are carved into it, the movement of the pencil, I feel the movement of the pencil, and it shows the intensity of that pain. It makes a difference between seeing a smooth line and seeing a jagged line when it comes to the way that we feel the work along with it. Dancing is a very big part of his later works. Bows are critically angels, and I'll just finish. He created 29 angel works, angel drawings, the last years of his life, and you can see that they range in the ideas of kind of sadness and pain and also joy. This is to give you a suggestion of how he's experienced feeling the last month of his life. And this is some of the original work painted at that time, where you can see you have a big, almost a suggestion of a figure, but of a body folding into itself. This is when he was diagnosed with a cardiac disorder, which is quite serious. Lily Clay, his wife, on the noses at the time. And this is the part of also, which is where he died. This is Clay in his living room in Bern, and the last work that he is known for, and I want to quickly look at this to try to understand it. Because though he never included it within his catalog, you can see that it's almost a catalog of works unto himself. Many people have suggested here that this is actually a representation of what his esophagus was feeling like at that time. You can see here the kind of pictographs that we had seen in some of the earlier work. And here you can see he quotes a drawing of his own of angels still ugly. <laughs> so there's a suggestion that this is almost a personal kind of of, uh, like opening up a picture and seeing how Clay wants himself to be remembered and represented, which is exactly what Lily Clay did, because you can see this is the painting, and this is where the urns of his ashes lived until she died. But I want you to look and recognize that Clay at this time isn't just creating this personal meditation, but he's also using similar tropes that his um, contemporaries did by including works with other works, and creating portraits that are inanimate, like um, Van Gogh's, as you see. Van Gogh was very influential because the very last work that he created and documented was actually two yellow houses, just like the yellow house that Van Gogh painted in the very last year of his life. But I would like to end with this because this shows the kind of import of Paul Clay. This is by Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin actually bought this work in 1920. Walter Benjamin was a very influential um, German Jewish academic who wrote from the Frankfurt School and became very influential on the left movement, kind of the Marxist. And he used this representation of Anwes you know, to represent all that was wrong and all that was right with the possibility of the changing of the world at this time. He takes it, as you can see, from a persona of this angel and decides his, that his face is turned towards the past where we can see the chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and rolls into the front of his feet. I think it's remarkable that this particular image, with all of its simplicity, could evoke and inspire such an interpretation, that it could bring something forward to this person who would then use it to be an emblem for an entire period of time. I think this is a fine testament to the importance of Clay's work and how it resonates with us. And if we can end remembering him as a lover of cats. <laughs> so this is Paul Clay and Mimbo. And that is my cat, Alice, who's very much enjoying the process of putting the talk together. So thank you very much.